Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti fat world. I'm Sophia, a fat person and professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears, we will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against diet culture, anti-fatness, ableism, racism, etc. If you'd like to support the Fat Joy podcast and get bonus content as a thank you, please check us out at patreon.com slash fatjoy. I am so glad you're here with us. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Fat Joy Podcast. I am Sophia, and I'm here with Martinez Evans. Hello, Martinez. It's so lovely to meet Hello, you. Hello, Sophia. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So, Martinez, I, I'm trying to remember. I always try to think about how did I find you? You came upon my socials in some way, and I was checking out what you were doing, and I was so excited that you're what, with what you've created, which I'm not going to spoil. I'm going to let you tell everyone. But um, suffice it to say, I think you're amazing. And I'm so glad you're here chatting with us. And I'm very excited to dive in with you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Mm-hmm. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in the world? Yes. So 10 years ago, my doctor called me fat, told me to either lose weight or die. I just have to pause you for a second. <laughs> lose weight or die. Those of you who've listened to this podcast know that that is some bullshit that we will not tolerate. Okay, continue. <laughs> so, yes, lose weight or die. Um, I said to him, Doc, like, screw you and screw all that. I'm going to run a marathon. Being sarcastic, also being a little facetious, but, like, you're just not going to call me fat and just tell me I'm going to die and I'm just going to just sit there and take it. He laughs at me and tells me that's the most stupidest thing he ever has heard in all of this year as a practice of medicine. What an asshole. I hope you don't see this person anymore. Absolutely not. Oh. So I bought some running shoes and that became my origin story. I bought some running shoes. I created this little blog called 300 Pounds of Running, which documented my journey as a slow fat runner um, and really just trying to figure out life as a runner. Um, fast forward to today, I've ran over eight marathons, a hundred other different races and i've created a little club you may or may not have heard of it called the slow Yuff run club uh, where our ultimate goal is to get um, one million people to get start running in the body that they have right now oh that's amazing and slow af af stands for as fuck slow as fuck run club it's up it's open for debate oh what what else look disney might call me and it could be slow and fabulous it could be slow and fun it can be slow and fluffy. Like, listen here. If the mouse calls me, slow, slow as fuck ain't slow as fuck no more. It's slow and AF whatever you want to call. Oh, uh, <laughs> I love that people can like make it whatever they want. My brain immediately went to the word fuck. So I love that. I wonder what my, mine would probably be slow and fluff, slow and fluffy, slow and fluffy runner. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. One million people. Yeah, set to go. Where are you now? So we got about ten thousand members inside of our run club um, worldwide. It's you no, know, we're we're jamming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So <laughs> the doctor called you fat and said you're going to die. So, what is your relationship <laughs> to the word fat? What has your journey been with that word? Oh man, my journey with the word fat has been up and down and around. So to give some context, I have a degree in exercise science. I have a degree in health promotion and I also have a degree in marketing. And those have not always been me. And the way I've looked at fat has not always been the way it is now. So just to give context, I got a degree in exercise physiology or exercise science because of the self-hate I had for myself in my current weight and the body I had then. So as a kid, I had boy boobs, man boobs, or things you want to call it, right? And like, I didn't know being fat was a bad thing 
until first grade. I'm not going to say the girl's name, but I remember her. And like in first grade, they had us stand up in front of the class and be like, you know, what do you care for? Or like, what are things you love? Back then, little Martinez had his whole heart on the sleeve and he had his crush on this girl. So he went up there to the front of the class and said, I have a crush or like care for redacted. Oh, you did. Redacted said, Ugh, you can't like me because your titties is bigger than mine. No, grade one. So you were like five, six. Oh, that's heartbreaking. So like my journey with fatness has always been like a negative one. And I would say throughout life, it has always been to like change that. Thus me getting this degree in exercise science, you know, and then also realizing that like once my fat body was able to be commoditized, i.e. playing football and getting a football scholarship. Martinez, that was the big guy who who was just a fat slob, is now a popular person because now my body's on the line to play in this sport. And it, it evolved from like the doctor called me fat and, you know, me saying, okay, I'm going to run this marathon, but still like there was still some like fat self hate against about me then because part of me was like, well, I've never seen a fat marathoner. And even if that marathon were as fat, like you run a couple, you'll still be fat. Right. And that didn't change. And until like I got into this very bad car accident um, after running my first marathon and all of the quote unquote weight that I had lost from like running um, and like restricting my diet and things of that sort, I gained it all back and got depressive. And I remember in the, in the spring, you know, living in new England at the time, like you get that first 50 degree day, everybody's outside. And I remember driving through the campus cause I was, uh, I was at, um, graduate school getting my, uh, master's degree. And I remember being like, dang, I wish I can run right now. I was still recovering from from the car accident. And I remember being like, you know, if I ever get the chance to run again, like I'll just run for the sake, the joy of it, because losing this weight, it wasn't like I was 80 pounds happier, right? None of that stuff happened, but what brought me joy and what was the most funnest out of all of the things were training and participating in races and talking to random strangers out on the course as we both were doing quote unquote crazy things together. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's so interesting. When you were, um, before your body was commodified, that's such an interesting way to say that, by the way, I really feel, I, I felt, I felt that when you said it. Um, but before that, when you were just kind of, you know, living in a bigger body, hating it, did you try different weight loss things? Like, did you diet? Did you do others? Like, I'm so curious what that was like. Any and everything. <laughs> um, weight loss pills, P90X, um, Xanity, like all the things, right? Because a lot of people don't realize that guys do that too. That's why I also want to ask it because I think, I think we think – Guys don't do the same stuff that women often do. I had a friend that was like, hey, he was working at UPS. And like for three months, he was like in the back of this UPS trailer, like moving boxes, doing like physical labor. And he like lost all his weight. And I remember him being like, hey, you should like work at UPS, like not just for the job, but like, yo, like this, uh, this will help you lose that weight real quick. Like, look at me. Yeah. Yeah. And so you tried all this stuff. Were you weight cycling? Was it going up and down? It wait, I weight cycle. It went up and down. And then, you know, when I started pl to play football and I was an offensive lineman, I was still like on the quote unquote lighter end of being an offensive lineman. So much so that my coach in college was like, hey, I need you to eat any and everything that's not bolted to the ground. Oh, what was it like to have that said to you? 
it messed with my head. <laughs> Can imagine. I'm not gonna lie, it messed with my head because you know, for the longest from like I said, from the first grade and the girl telling me, Hey, my your titties are bigger than mine to like my was it my sophomore my sophomore or junior year of high school playing football. It was ill, you're fat, yada yada yada. Like you don't deserve joy. You should be losing weight. But then some someone started playing football, it's like you're not fat enough. You need to get fatter. Like you need to get bigger. And I remember um being in high school and maybe weighing like 265, 275, and like me thinking like that's fat. And then going into college and the coach being like, Yeah, we need to get you like 330, 350. So again, lots of body manipulation, weight manipulation. And were you able to do that? Did you follow what your coach said? How did yeah. So like, yeah, I went through that and I did do that. And the interesting part of all of that is that I ended up losing my football scholarship. What? After you put your body through all of that. So the coach quits goes to a new school, new coach comes in and says, everybody has to retry out. Oh, that sucks. Yes. And Martinez at that age was like, well, I'm not about to retry out. Like, screw this. I'm going home. And that's what I did. I went home and I, I went to like one of the local schools from where I'm from and just became, uh, as we call a, a GDI, goddamn individual. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard that. What does that mean, a goddamn individual? What does that represent? It's it's just reference of like when you're an athlete on like a college campus, like regardless if the team suck or not, like you're kind of like put on this pedestal, right? So it's like you got the athletes and then you got like all the other individual peoples, like the individuals, right? Like <laughs> you don't necessarily have a, a title unless you're like with a sorority or things of that sort. So it's like, I'm just going to be a GDI. Like, I'm just going to be a goddamn individual and just, like, be myself and, like, fall into um, the mode of regular everyday life. Was that a relief? It was. But those habits that I were indoctrinated to have playing football, I kept them. Which was, like eat everything that's not boarded to the ground. Um, and it, it was hard. It was a rough journey to go through that and be like, all right, like now I'm not an athlete anymore. I have these habits. And then my head, is, it goes back to like depression and like feeling unworthy because it's like, well, since I'm not being a football athlete or like an athlete, like I'm not being celebrated for being this big. Like, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. It really starts to question identity. And that's such a time in life where I think a lot of people have a struggle. I certainly did. I was an athlete. And then when I, and I used to, I was a swimmer, a soccer player, but I was more, more of a swimmer. And I used to swim and weightlift, like, I don't know, 10, 15 hours a week. And then suddenly that stops, but I'm still like, you know, acting as if, and it was a real, I, rem I remember feeling Oh, so confused. <laughs> like I was confused about my body. I was confused about who am I now. Um, it's a really transition times are always really weird, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. So, and at this point you weren't yet studying. Um, the, how, what did you say your master's is? No, cause you, this was undergrad. So then you went back and did a master's in health promotion, health promotion. And what did, yeah, I'm so curious about what you realized as you were studying health in a deeper way. Let, let's continue the story because like we're going to lead there. So graduate undergrad, um, my girlfriend, who's my wife and I was like, hey, I'm going to grad school. So I follow her there and I find myself at men's warehouse. So like, you're going to like the way you look. I guaranteed it. Like that type of guy, like selling suits. As a big guy, and I'm like at the top of their range when it comes to clothing. So like that messed with me a lot. But the other benefit is that the cut them out of uh, the, uh, being a commodity so that 
everybody else in men's warehouse like was a smaller statured guy me be this big guy a big guy in a suit and everybody be like hey like i don't want to work with y'all skinny dudes like i want to work with the big fat tall guy like i want him because you looked like they did yes because i look like they did and it's like well if you can make this this guy fit like fit good in the suit like i want whatever techniques he's learned and like what suits look good on him like i want it on me and that's during that process, that's when I kind of ran into the doctor who called me fat, things of that sort. So now you kind of understand like where I came from to where the doctor called me fat. And like, let's move on forward to graduate school. And so, like I said, doctor called me fat, worked at Men's Warehouse, um, started running, started physical therapy, and then I land myself in grad school at UConn getting a master's and health promotion. And one of the things that I was doing or I just found fascinating during that time back in 2012 was like this, like the boom of weight loss bloggers and everybody like blogging about their journey and things of that sort. And, you know, I was a part of it as well because like that was the part of my journey and like I did my master thesis on like, the study of weight loss bloggers and like the readers of weight loss bloggers, right? Oh, interesting. Yeah. What were you studying specifically? So like when you think about health, you know, they're always looking at like, well, what are ways that people can lose weight or like, how can we make people lose weight? Which of course is based on the assumption that fat equals bad, which is faulty. But at this point we don't know that yet. Exactly. <laughs> So for me, like my studies were about like surveying weight loss bloggers to really figure out like how, A, how much weight they were they losing, but also about like how, like how are they doing this? Like what are the methods and why do they think that blogging about like this weight loss journey provides them with the support that they need in order to lose weight? And then for the reader's aspect, the same thing, like, you know, as a reader reading somebody's journey of losing weight, like, does that too also make you want to lose weight and like follow in their footsteps and losing it as well? So interesting. And what did you find, Martinez? I'm dying to know. It's been a while ago. Um, <laughs> but, and it's funny because you mentioned that, but like, a, this, this, this research has been published. So I, I did publish some scientific articles about that. So I don't remember all of the, the results, but I know that like weight loss bloggers were losing weight. People who were reading weight loss blogs were losing weight. And uh, from the reader aspect, there's this notion um, called the transportation theory. So basically what it is, is like, um, like reading narratives. So like the fact of like you reading, say Harry Potter or like whatever the childhood book is and like you read it and like you then put yourself inside of that book as the character and go through that journey. The same thing was happening for individuals who were reading weight loss blogs. Like they're put their own self in the shoes of the person who were going through this and then be like, Hey, I want to do this as well. Yeah. That's so interesting. I mean, it. I keep thinking about how that's so, that's very much like the power of storytelling is that we kind of move into like a deep empathy state where we really feel like we are. I mean, I will say that is absolutely the reason I started this podcast and that it's not research based and like, I'm not like spouting off stats and all that because I, I, totally believe in the power of storytelling and stories to shift people's minds and hearts. And so that makes that tracks. And I, I'm also, I wonder too, like if there was something about the community aspect of the, for the readers, like knowing that they're one of many who are witnessing this blogger's journey, they're part of a community because we know that's super powerful as well. To feel like you're part of a group. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, 
So at what point, so from there, and I guess you'll probably tell me, but, but at what point did it suddenly feel like, oh, hang on a minute. F- fat isn't bad, question mark? Like, I feel like so many of us have this moment. <laughs> so while we're going through grad school, we're learning all these things. We're training for marathons, things of that sort. And like, I have that bad car crash. So I like, I run my first marathon in Detroit in October, 2020, uh, 2020, 2013. Oh my God. Was it amazing? Ah, yay. Good for you. And you were your, the size you are like, had your weight shifted? No, you ran a marathon as a fat person. Uh, ran, ran a marathon. I lost some weight, but I was still a fat guy. I still had man titties and like, but I was still like, I, at that point, like I was bought in on that, like continue to lose weight people telling me i look good like but they not understanding all the things that i'm trying and doing behind the scenes right and i have that car accident january um 2014 and like from there my life changed so i wasn't able to run for about seven months oh no so run or be active because um like I had like some neck injury stuff and things of that sort. So like I wasn't able to run for seven months. So all of the things that I knew about weight loss and things of that sort, um, I just felt like I was contradicting myself. So you get into this car accident and like you start to slowly start to bloom back up. Um, like I start to put on the weight, but I'm still like learning about like all these weight loss techniques and like these weight loss studies and things of that sort, because like the professor that was my, um, I forgot what you even call them, now, but like my advisor, like that's what she got her, her bread in. Like she studied weight loss. And when you're in grad school and you get this degree, like you, like you just follow along with them because you want to graduate. Oh yeah. Your advisor has like all the power. Yes. And that's during the part where I was driving one day on campus and, you know, it's a balmy 55 degrees on UConn's campus and people are out running like in the Midwest in New England, 55 degree day during winter. Like that's when you barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> um, like that's when you do all the amazing things. And from there, like that was where it really hit me to say like, like I'm beating myself up about like gaining all this weight. I'm going through this degree, but I feel like I'm like constantly contradicting myself because like, who am I to like study weight loss and like want to be a weight loss researcher, but I'm gaining all this weight and like, I'm not having fun. And the thing I really just want to do is run races. And that was the promise I made to myself. And I was like, if I'm able to run again, like I'm just going to run for the sheer joy of it and like not worry about weight loss. Like I'm just going to let my body do what it do and, and I'm just going to have fun with it. That's a huge shift. That's a huge mindset shift. Wow. Yeah. It was almost like a cry for help. Cause like, I'm depressed. I'm sad. Like, I feel like what I'm going to school for and like what's translating in real life is not adding up. And like you, you read all these articles about like people and weight loss and like, Oh, you should try this and like use these studies and yada, yada, yada. Like almost like I'm seeing like the same stuff happen again. Yes. Over and over, (laughs) over and over again. Yeah. So like um back then I was like there was this huge study that like this huge like diabetes study. I don't know if you know where I'm going with this. It was a huge diabetes study of like and this is the the gold standard of like diabetes education and things of that sort. But like one of the um side studies or like the side information was like individuals lost some weight. So then they was like, all right, well, let's run this diabetes education to everybody and see if we can get everybody to lose weight. And then like, you can kind of see that going on with another brand 
another weight loss, not even weight loss, but like a diabetes medication. That's like all of a sudden. Ozempic. <laughs> you can use this diabetes medication to lose weight. Ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so like you start to learn all this stuff and like during grad school, right? I, one of the things I, I, I like to tell people is that in undergrad, like you're there to like learn and regurgitate whatever you learned to get the grade. In grad school, you're asking a lot of questions. You're asking, you challenge everything. How did they get there? Can this study be replicated? You know, what are the, what, what are the cons of the study? What are the pluses about this study? Are they using the gold standard? Like you learn how to like tear apart bits and pieces of stuff that people put out there. And then you're just taught to like challenge everything. So during that X process, like I just started to challenge everything inside of my life as well. Like, you know, one of the questions I always ask is that, you know, we, we always talk about like, you know, diet and weight loss, having these outcomes on like people with like weight loss, um, lower A1Cs, blood pressure, all these other things. And then, you know, my question to them was like, well, was it the weight loss or was it the physical activity that you put them through? Yes. Great question. <laughs> Did you start pissing everybody off? <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> so then like I just started going on that journey. It was like, y'all, y'all talk about like diet and 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 weight loss, but like what if it's not that? What if it's just regular physical activity? And then you start to for me, I started to go down that journey. And really find out, like, what well, regular physical activity are associated with these things as well. So then for me, it started to be like, well, well, which one is it? Is it the the lack of physical activity that can, like, help improve everybody's, um, like, outcomes? Or is it the weight loss? And then for me, like, as I continue to go down the journey, and it's like, it's not the weight loss because we already know about, like, adiposity rebound and, like, um, everybody who joins a diet or does a diet is, you know, 90% more likely to like gain back that weight even more. But the only thing that stood through all of that was physical activity. So for me, that was the, like the, the, like the light bulb was already flashed, but like it made my bright, my light shine brighter because the question I started to ask was what if the the solution to all of the America's like uh, health crisis is joy, <laughs> not shame? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That is a very important question, <laughs> and you know where I fall. <laughs> <laughs> fat joy, fat joy. Exactly. <laughs> so those are the things, and like those are the experiences that kind of like really helped me change the way that I really looked at my physical journey, like what I, what I thought about with 300 pounds of running, what I thought about with like just running races and like experiencing all the other things that come around with like running races and being in this body. So like people always think, well, this is your first time. You know, they always look at you like, Oh, keep going. You got it. It's okay. You know, you don't get a shirt your size. You know, you got people when you try to stand up for yourself, like people are like lose weight or, you know, lose weight and get faster and like all these other things. And for me, it's like, I just want to be able to enjoy the things that everybody else is doing. And if, and if I paid money to participate in this race and I did my training to do it, why shouldn't I not get the same treatment? Because I'm not falling in line with what you think I need to be doing. Right. Or how I need to be looking. Right. Like that's, yeah. I'm so mad at everything all the time. Just so you know, Martinez, I'm <laughs> like angry with the world because what I hear that's just so powerful is you st like you start to see through a lot of the the way like we've known for a hundred years at least a full century that dieting doesn't work and yet capitalism and commodification and ableism and healthism and the diet industrial complex like have all colluded to make us think that the thinner we are 
the happier we'll be and we all have to fit. And of course, then we get into racism and white supremacy. Like if our bodies don't look this ideal way, white, cis, hetero, thin, you know, neurotypical, all of that, then, you know, we're lower on the scale. Right. And so there's so much colluding together. And I'm, I'm pretty amazed. Like I was, I think mid thirties before I saw through a lot of it. I'm always jealous of people who see through it sooner because like you saw through it when, even when you were surrounded by it, even when everyone in your masters was like, like your advisor, this is how they made their money was propagating in, you know, they were colluding as well. They were probably being funded by, you know, Novo Nordisk and all of these, right? So that's pretty amazing that you saw through it all and was like, hang on, I'm just going to take the parts that I, that I can tell work well for me, which is to connect to the joy of moving my body exactly as my body is. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so you did that, you started running and then when did you begin to form slow AF? Like how did, how did that progression happen? So slow AF happened. You're going to see a trend here. The trend is somebody pisses me off or tell me I can't do something. <laughs> and then I go and do it. Anyway. <laughs> I like it. A fellow rebel. Yes. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> so I'm running a race. Um, I can't remember which race it was. Um, and this drunk guy and like, I'm in the back of the pack. I'm doing my own thing and it's a marathon. So I'm almost near the end, but like, it's like mile 20. I still, still got a ways to go. And I remember this drunk fucker being like, Oh, like go home. Like from the sidelines. He wasn't even running from the sidelines. What an asshole. Come on. Go home. You're slow as fuck, man. Why are you out here? Go home. And like me have a, like I have my headphones in and like I'm jamming and then I see somebody like yelling or like doing whatever. So I think he's like trying to tell me something. So I'm like taking my headphones out and be like, what? Like what's going on? Go home. You're slow as fuck. And I'm like, what? Like you slow as fuck. Go home. And I'm like, I went from like confused to like, so you telling me I'm slow as fuck, but I'm the one that's running the race and yo ass drunk on the sideline. Like, if you don't get the hell up out of here, I put my headphones back in and like that resonated with me. Mm. And from that point on, I was like, I'm going to run races with slow AF across my chest. Oh my God. That's what started it. I yes. love that. So <laughs> I start to run these races with slow AF across my chest. Like you had t-shirts made. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's so for myself. I just had so slow good. AF across my chest. And then, like, I'll be at races and people are like, hey, that's funny. Like, I didn't want, any, want one of these shirts. <laughs> and I wasn't selling them, but somebody, I, I got to know people was like, hey, like, I want a slow AF shirt. Like, okay. I did a little pre order campaign. 500 people bought a slow AF shirt. No, 500. Yes. yes. You really tapped into something. Yes. <laughs> so. 500 people bought a shirt and then people started to ask me like, Hey, like you got a group or something. Like I want to, I want to connect with other people who bought these shirts as well. And like, that was the, the, the inkling to move forward to slow your front club. Yeah. What do you think they saw in those words emblazoned across your chest? Like, what do you think people resonated with? I think the thing is that when it comes to running, Everything about running is about numbers. Like how fast you run equals to how greater of a person that you are in uh, life. So like self-worth is really wrapped up in this. Yeah. Okay. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's tied to numbers. Um, and I think for a lot of people seeing slow AF across my shirt and being like, and seeing me have fun and just having joy and like them wanting that and like knowing what that represented they wanted to be a part of that versus chasing after those numbers. Yeah. I almost, it's like it gives permission to people to kind of almost, I almost wonder if it allows them, because when I was reading your thing and I was looking at the group, I'm like, oh, I, I was so aware that this feels like it would connect me back to when I was a kid and I ran 
just to see how fast my legs could go, like just for the pure joy. And I remember I used to like leap across puddles and it was just, it felt like I was flying. Like there was no societal like ideal body or like there was nothing. It was just pure movement for the sake that I have movement abilities, you know? So there's something really pure about it. I wonder if people were feeling too. Yeah. And I think that was the the journey is that I wanted, I just wanted something different. Um, because I was a, I was a part of various Facebook groups. And like, I remember during that time, just like just falling out of love with all of these groups, right? Like all the groups, even like some of the slow running groups I was a part of, like even though they were some slow runners, like the goal was to get faster or to like lose weight. And I just remember being like, this is not what I want to be a part of. Like, I don't care that you ate five salads this week. I don't care that you drunk a gallon of water like that's I mean, like, uh, for the day. Like, I just don't care. Like what I care about is like, how are you having fun? And like, what's the next race we're all going to run together so we can continue to have fun together. Yeah. And then from there, so you have this 500, were you surprised by the number 500 people who wanted your Very shirts? Very surprised. Right? And you're yes. like, oh shit, I'm onto something. And then, so what did you do then? Um, from there, I went on our process to figure out how do, how do I get an app made or like, how do I, how do I go through the process? Because I, I wanted something different. I didn't want to be on Facebook. I didn't want another Facebook group just everybody, like everybody else has. I wanted something different. So I just went on that journey to find something that helped out with that. And now we're here with an app that has, you know, 10,000 people inside of it buzzing and talking about the joy of running and having fun without the pressures of losing weight. Um, and we don't even talk about weight loss. Like that's one of the goals It's like, we don't talk, there's no weight loss talk. I was going to ask what I was going to ask about. How do you hold that space being like, it sounds like it's an anti-diet space. So how do you, is it moderated or is it? Yeah. So we have moderators. We have about six or seven moderators and um, in our um, new member handbook, it, it, it lets them know we don't talk about weight loss here. Like if that's your, if that's your journey, cool. There's so many other places out here in the world that you can go to, to talk about weight loss. Slow Up Run Club is not that, you know, when you talk about food, we don't talk about food in like a restrictive way. It's about how are you fueling yourself um, to be an athlete and to be a runner. And those are the questions you should be asking. And if you're asking other questions about, specific diets or things of that sort, I, I'll let them know that this is not the place for it. Do you, do you know how rare that is? <laughs> Martina's like, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, like to be part of, because I'm part of a lot of fat positive Facebook groups where this is also made really clear and it's a lovely, and I'm starting just now, actually as a result of this podcast, starting to find more movement, physical movement spaces where this happens. And it's still so rare to be able to be in an exercise, I hate the word exercise, but in a movement oriented, athletic oriented, ath yeah, space that does not make it about food and body size. And that's just amazing. Um, what do your what do the members say? Like, what do they love the most about this? Um, I, I think they just love the fact that we can just get to the other parts of running and just the other parts of being able to move your body without all the other, like I said, crap that goes along with diet culture. Because it takes up so much space, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it does. Uh, I've I had um, another podcast conversation with someone who is starting for me a local chapter like Toronto area for of body liberation hiking because I love hiking I love being outside and we were talking about that too how it's kind of 
I'll say the word sad. This is not the word they use, but I find it kind of sad, very, that in, we have to set a whole bunch of rules <laughs> about what you cannot talk about in order to create a liberated, safe as possible space for everyone in it. It's like, God, we've really cluttered it up, haven't we, in our world with all of that. So to, to remove it, it's always an adjustment for people. And then they start to get the hang of it. So um, that's so great that you've got that. And 10,000 people, that's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, um, it, it is amazing. You know, I, I, I love that community. And, and, and it's just something that I wish I would have had when I first started 10 years ago. You know, and I think that's the thing, like going through therapy and all this stuff. Like, I, I just feel like I'm just um, parenting the 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 younger Martinez with all of the materials that like I should have had when I started running. So, for example, like creating merch, right? Like understanding that process, going to China, well, not me going to China, but like talking to Chinese suppliers, telling them what I want and like figuring out sizing. I literally have written down here clothing sizing question mark. <laughs> Cause I'm, cause yeah, cause I'm looking at your, your hoodie. I totally want one. And I'm like, oh, but will there be a size for me? Which is my immediate question always when it comes to clothing. And so the answer is, how have you solved that? Most of our clothing go up to a six or seven X. Amazing. So you were able to find a supplier that could do that for you. Well, the thing, one of the things you find out when you start like getting to clothing supplier, they'll make whatever they want, you want them to make. Oh. They'll make whatever they want, you want them to make for you. You just have to provide them with like measurements. Oh, great. That's great. I went on that journey and that was a journey in itself to like women's sizing is a fucking shit show. It is a fucking shit show. Yes. I'm so glad to hear a man say that. It is a <laughs> shit show. Like nobody, <laughs> like, <laughs> Every woman listening is laughing right now. <laughs> I'm just trying to compose myself because like, <laughs> it's a shit show. <laughs> and as a dude who's like worked in fashion, like men's, I, I consider myself somewhat of a fashionista, right? Like I worked at a men's warehouse. Like I understand men's size and like everything's tied to a number, right? Suit jackets are tied to like they, they chest, like a 56 regular is usually because the person has a 56 inch chest, right? Makes sense. Feels like it's a good system. <laughs> exactly. 38 inch <laughs> pant or like a 38 pant, 38, 30 means they have a 30 inch waist and a 30 inch inside inseam. Yeah. You go to women's clothing. I don't know what the fuck an 18 means. No, and it's different in every store. It's different exactly. in, in the same store. You could try on an 18 or a 24 or whatever in the same store, and they will all fit differently. It makes no sense. I have no idea what they mean. So, <laughs> so how did you solve that? <laughs> trying a lot of different brands. Um, and it was a very expensive process. So, like, um, when I first started, one of the things I did was, like, all right, I want to make a T-shirt tank top and i was like all right like t-shirts i can kind of get because like there's a lot of brands like that does like unisex t-shirts that goes all the way up into like a six or seven x right but like making a racerback women's tank top the hardest thing i had to do in my life that's interesting that that was the hardest one yes because like you're thinking about cuts and all this other stuff and like well, and breast sizes, yes, and body sizes. Exactly. Yeah, that is so true. So like I'm buying different brands. Like my wife was getting on my nerves because like I was literally buying like full size runs of various brands, laying them on the bed <laughs> and like, all right, this is their extra large. This is their extra large. This is their extra large. Land them all on top of each other. And like the measurements be drastically different. Like inches and inches off. Yes. Yeah. Even for like the plus size women clothing, right? Laying that stuff on top of each other. And be like, this does not match. I know. 
<laughs> so calling friends, like after I figured this stuff, I was like, all right, I got to do something. So my thing was like, all right, I'm just going to like take averages. Like it's, it's like, real. like it's going to stretch. Like let's take some averages and like, let's buy some samples and like, let's put it on people and see how it goes. Great. And you know, for the most part, like the run with the t-shirts and the tank tops it worked out pretty well. Like they were a little bit on the longer side, but I think that was more my fault because I'm a taller guy. So I'm like, I want to have like a little bit longer, but like I could have shortened it maybe about two or three inches, but like it worked out pretty well. So now the second go round, like now we're doing uh, long sleeve tees, hoodies, uh, leggings, and like biker shorts. Nice, nice. A complete shit show all over again. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. You basically, you've gone through enough work that you have to start a fashion empire at this point because like <laughs> you're finding all the ways to fix it, hopefully. Yes. And then, so you go through that. And then one of the things I also understand was like gatekeeping inside of this. So I've had stores, like, I, like I said, I'll buy a full size run and like compare sizes. And like, I, I bought a company that has or like there's companies out there that has like clothing tech packs or like some sample measurements. So like I'm looking at their measurements, I'm comparing sizes from like all of these brands and like people are reaching out to me. Like there were certain brands that I canceled my order. There was like, no. Like we don't want plus size people wearing our clothing. Therefore we will not do plus size like that kind of gatekeeping. Mm -mm. Like me buying clothes from a plus, plus size brand. And then reach out to say like, hey, like, what are you doing? We see that you are buying like one of each size. Like, what are you doing? And like me being. They're worried you're copying them or something. And me being the person that's like, yes, like I'm trying to do research. Like I'm trying to compare sizes to like help figure out my stuff. And a few companies is like. Our, our materials, like our clothes are proprietary. Is that for real? No, that's not for real. I'm like, if I go to Torrid, which is like the only plus size store in Canada that's worth buying anything at, we're very limited up here, which is deeply frustrating, but that's another, that's another podcast episode. Um, so if I buy a one X through a six X, like, and I model and I have my own clothing line and I model my measurements after theirs, like they can't stop that. Can they? They canceled my order. I have two brands that canceled my order and was like our, our size is proprietary. And we don't want you copying in our sizes. <gasps> That's not cool. Not cool at all. Wow. Which, I mean, that has huge implications for why, again, if you think about why finding plus sizes is so complicated, this is probably one, one little piece of that puzzle. And like, I'm just trying to create merch. Like, I'm just trying to, because that's the thing. Like, my thing is like, I'm a 3X, 4X type of guy, depending on the weather, right? Whether I got my, my, my winter fur on or like I'm, I'm out in the summer and I'm moving and shaking. But like, if I can't, if, if I cannot provide merch that can at least can't fit a 300 pound man that's like six three, like I don't want to do it. And that's the same with women. Like I want to be able to like help support and give them the cool stuff that I'm making as well. And if I ask the women inside of my community, like, hey, like, what are you wearing? What do you find that fits well or somewhat well? And then I go out and do the research and then they stop me because they feel like I'm copying them. That's. Mm -mm. Oh, it's fucking capitalism again. Yeah. Yeah. God damn it. It's so, so frustrating. So were you able to find a way around it? If you Absolutely. can say. Oh, okay, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Good. Absolutely. You might stop me. But you can't stop anybody from buying clothes. I was just gonna say I'd be like, all right, you friend, you buy this this style, this size, you friend, you buy this style, this size. Like right. fuck that. Ah. Oh, so frustrating. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. Did you ever imagine that this would have been the most complicated part of setting up? <laughs> no. No. Um, but it, it, it has given me like the courage to do more things like this, right? To really understand that anything is possible. I can do whatever I want to do. Even if people try to stop me or gatekeep me, like 
I'm from Detroit. I'm a kid from Detroit. I know how to hop a fence. Like you can put a gate up all you want, but like there, there's going to be a way for me to figure out how to get this done. And then like the thing is like when it comes to clothing, like a t-shirt is a t-shirt, a legging pattern is a legging pattern. Like Lycra is Lycra. You might get it from the same or like from a different manufacturer, but like it's all the same. And all I'm really just trying to do is provide access to individuals or give people the the option to be able to purchase my merch, right? And and I get it. Like I understand like some of the woes of it, right? Like, um, like I said, some of my clothes go to a six X, and you know, understand like, all right, I bought this many, but you know, say I bought ten pieces of a, a size, and only like two people bought something like, all right, like I understand now, like I see why certain brands and things of that sort. But for me, like that necessarily didn't deter me, but what it made me figure out is like, all right, either a, how do I promote it to other individuals to say like, Hey, like I do go up to a seven X or B like, what are the other ways to make sure these individuals get the clothing? Like, is it a special order type of thing or a versus or, or is it, Instead of me ordering like 10 pieces in that size, like can I order three or five so that like I, I there there at least something there for somebody who's like, hey, I like that T-shirt. They go there and they see a 7X or a 6X. They can cop it and it's there. So like really just thinking about that as well of me being a small business, like this stuff is expensive, especially when it comes to clothing. Like it's one of those types of businesses where like you got to spend up a lot of money up front to get stuff going. And then it takes a, a, a time, like a time to get it. Like it takes anywhere from like 60 to 90 days from when you make an order from them to process it and then ship it to you. Um, and like just really thinking through all of those things that I understand what some of these brands are doing, but I also don't understand it because it still can be done. And really understanding, like, how can you, how can you self-select, um, like, self-select your way out of somebody's size when, like, you can do it. And then you also have this culture that's like, oh, lose weight and die. Like, you should be, you should be active. Like, that's live. You should be doing all this other stuff. And it's like, but there's no clothes for me to do it. There's no clothes. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm really excited about. Yeah, for you, because I can imagine like as more and more people join this, you may have the 4X people joining because there will be a safe space for them to do it. And then, yeah, like I, I, yeah, it, oh, there's so many contradictions that are not helpful for fat people. And I thank you for taking on behalf of all fat people. Thank you for taking on the fashion industry and working your way through that. Cause I, I know I, I had a really great interview with um, the founder of Ember and Ace who was trying to do children's athletic wear. And that's a whole thing. There, there are no patterns available. There are no fit models available. There are no stock photographers or photography available of plus size kids. Like it, it's just the gatekeeping in this industry is brutal, brutal. Yes. Yeah. There's so many complications. Um, but that's great. I'm glad th- I I'm, I'm just grateful that you're like working your way through it. I think it's going to make a difference for a lot of people. Thank you. And you know, I don't know what's going to come from it, but just the fact of staying curious and just trying things and like working your way all the way through the process to like to see it done, to like see this turtle. I love this turtle. (laughs) My thing was like, I love Paisley. Like my turtle is amazing. Like, let me do this whole Paisley turtle pattern and like figure this out just to make it because I wanted it. Yeah. And. (laughs) <laughs> it's great. And if I want it, somebody else will want it, want it as well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to, of course, talk about the book that is going to be coming out. So this episode's going to air, when did I say? May 31st. And the book's coming out the next week, the week of June, June 6th. So walk us through how you went from the run club to the book. Yeah. So 
Um, here is the book here. There's Slow the book. Run Club, the ultimate guide for anybody who wants to run. Um, this book here is taking a combination of the 10 years of me running in this 300 pound body and everything I wish somebody would have told me when I started. Um, so it's part memoir and part instruction manual. And I think, I really think it's amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things you'll read through, you know, once you pick it up, one of the things you'll read through is like each chapter starts off with a cautionary tale. So like something fucked up that happened to me like through running. So like running a marathon and like the SAG vehicle like heckles me, right? Or like um or like staying in San Francisco Bay Area for a while and like um I, I start to like try to run with various running clubs and like one of the clubs re- leave me, right? Just leave me in the dust. Oh, geez. just like they're like all paces of walk on as long as you have a 10 minute mile or faster. And then me come, it's like, well, you know, my fastest run, maybe like a 15 minute mile and then be like, well, try to keep up. And then as I slow down, they're like, keep up big fella. And then like they go on about their day. Right. Oh, or like just some of the other things that I may have experienced, right? Um, and then the lessons learned from there, as well as like teaching people, um, like all the things I just learned when it comes to like running, you know, form, nutrition, things of that sort. Because it is a little bit different. Like most, like most running manuals or books comes from elite athletes or coaches of elite athletes, you know, telling you what they did to get the the elite athlete to run faster or like to perform on a larger stage. But there's not a running book out there that's like, Hey, I did this as this person in my body. And this, these are all the things I learned the hard way. Like, for example, like body glide or like uh, for the women, like mega babe, right? I was running for a good year and a half not knowing about these materials. Oh, chafing, chafing. Running in cotton shirts and taking showers and just feeling like I've been cut by a thousand razors. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Yeah, you got to lube up. <laughs> yeah. So I took all of those, all of those stories, all of those lessons learned and put it in this book for the next guy or girl to get out on the road and be able to have some sort of manual to start running. Because let me tell you, like when we talk about like formulas and things of that sort, most running books, they got formulas and stuff. Like, you know, you run this pace, this is what you should be running at every time. This is how you get faster running at these paces. You should be exercising and running at these days. Don't miss a day. If you miss a day, you suck at life, things of that sort. And then my book is more like, Hey, this is what worked for me. None of this stuff is set in stone. You need, I want to empower you to figure out what works best for you. And this is just a guideline of like what I did and what I learned the hard way in order to get there. That's going to have so much good info for people. I love that. I love that. I can't wait to get my copy when, when it comes out. Absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing. And, how long did it take you to write the book? Oh man, about 18 months. Yeah, people think it's really quick. I'm also a also do creative writing uh-huh. coaching and I work with a lot of writers and I myself also thought I could write a memoir in 6 months and it's been like 7 <laughs> years. I again, we have these perceptions. Oh, I just bang out a book, but no, 18 months. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, you know, I'm a very methodical guy when it comes to writing. Um Shout out to like master theses, right? Um, but when my publisher was like, Hey, all right, we're going to give you this book deal, 75,000 words. Here's the date. And the first thing I said was, Holy crap, like 75,000 words. Like, sheesh, the hell am I right for 75,000 words or 74,000 words? And then from there, um, I was like, All right, I have, you know, this amount of time. Like, let me just do the math. Like, what is the math if I did, you know, five days a week 
let's say even say four days a week of writing. Like what what is the minimum amount of, of words I need to write if I just took four days a week to to write? And it came up to be like 198 words. That's a good amount. That's awesome. I was like, okay, I can do 198 <laughs> words. It's a paragraph. Yeah. Like, I can do 198 words. <laughs> and from there, I, I just sit down every day. And, like, that was the goal. And, of course, like, once you get going, like, you're going to pump out more than 198 words. You got to have a few drafts. Yeah. Yeah, but I was like, all right, I can do this. And then some days uh, I'll produce 4,000 words. And then some days I'm like, all right, I got 100. And then some days it's, you know, it's uh, three pages of like useless words. Because my goal was like, all right, I'm going to sit here for um, three hours a day. I need to get 198 words. And if I'm sitting here at this computer and just typing out, this is dumb for three hours, this is what I'm typing out. And what I found out is that after 30 minutes of typing out, this is dumb. Like your mind going to type, like your fingers are going to do whatever it's going to do. So I'll just start like writing out proses and be like, oh, okay, like this is great for a middle part of the story. Like I need to figure out where to go from here. And then I'll start writing some more and then I, I'll lose it. And then it's like, this is dumb. This is dumb. This is dumb. And then like more words to come out. And I'm like, oh, like this would be great for like the nutrition chapter. Like, let me save that and put it there. But like, I'm still on this chapter here. And then going back to like, this is dumb. This is dumb. And then like other words that come out. And then next thing you know, like I'm starting to like form like paragraphs and like pages and things of that sort. And, and it, it just kind of worked out for me that way. It's great. Yeah. That's a beautiful process of like both tenacity and commitment, but also like flexibility where you just were like, I'll show up and I'm going to trust that the words are going to show up for me and I'm going to allow that to flow and I'm just going to build and build and build. That's great. That's really great. Yeah. So for all your aspiring writers out there telling you, sit down and write, this is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. You set a timer and you just like, whatever you write, I hate this. I hate everything. <laughs> yep. Yep. Very cool. Wow. Are you so proud of the book? I'm so proud of this book. Um, I just can't wait to get it in everybody's hands. Um, you know, the publisher was looking at me a little crazy at first because I'm like, hey, I'm giving away the first chapter for free. Like, just go read it. Yeah. And I'm going to link to that in the show notes. So it'll be there. Yeah. Because I wholeheartedly feel like if you read the intro and first chapter, you'll be hooked. And like this book will be a bestseller because I, I put a lot of, I just put everything that I have in this book. Amazing. Oh, I'm so excited to read it. And you know, it's, it's so interesting talking to you because I used to run. Um, and then, and I, I stopped, well, I was quite ill actually for the last couple of years. So my, my physical movement has been really impacted, you know, by not moving very much for a couple of years, but I took myself away a couple of months ago. I did a little three day, um, away in the country at like an Airbnb and I was doing this walk through their fields and I suddenly felt this urge. I was like, I need to go a little faster. I need, I just feel like the sun's shining. There's some horses up there. I just want to like, just, and I just started a slow jog. And it was so interesting because it took, it, I suddenly felt rather than the effort of walking, I felt like the glide and flow of a, like very slow. I was slow AF, um, of like a jog. And I was like, oh, I forgot. Like, but I was also amazed that my body remembered how to do it. So that was the other thing for me. And I'm just getting so inspired listening to you is that reminder that like our bodies for the most part, like know how to do this. And if we, you know, those of us who are able, like kind of go at our own pace, do what feels good, not hurt ourselves. Like there was something really joyful about just me, just being in that moment and moving my body in that way. I, I, I really had gotten so disconnected from so this is what I tell people, because a lot of people, when they think of running, they can think of like running like the Olympics. They think of like Hussein Bolt, like Usain Bolt, like 
I'm going to run as fast as possible for forever and like less running and really teaching individuals that like you can run and it may not look like what you see in the Olympics, but it's still running. And I think for a lot of people, just a, a lot of us, even this generation, I've talked to my wife about this, um, about how this generation, a lot of people is like, they're trained of like, oh, that's not the right way to do it. Like, this is how I wasn't trained. This is the, the absolute best way to do this versus being like, how do I do it for myself? How do I do this so that I'm doing it in a joyful manner? And I'm injury free. Like, how do I do this? And like, it just works for me. And I think a lot of us just need to take that approach of it may not work for anybody else, but as long as it works for you, that's what really matters. I love that. And it doesn't have to look a certain way or be a certain way. And yeah, because mine looked probably if someone was looking at me, they probably would have shot thought about like, why is that person kind of shuffling along this path? But it felt amazing. Like I felt like I was moving so fast and I felt like I was flying. I was not, but it felt so good. So it really was like, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. If we can just step away from like outside expectations of how things are supposed to be or how things are should be and just kind of reconnect to what is true about us in a given moment and move according that way. And, and, and that's the, and that's the message is that your body is, is the way it is today. It doesn't matter what it look, what it looked like 10 years ago or how it moved 10 years ago, or what you look like in high school. This is the body you have right now. Let's figure out how to move that body in a way that you can do it right now and do it joyfully. Because like, whole honestly, like my, my thoughts and beliefs is that everybody should be physically active full stop. Like there's so many other benefits to being physically active that everybody needs to have some sort of physical activity and whatever way they feel the most joyful and the most like whatever that thing is, but we all should have some sort of physical activity because that's the way to stay vibrant and as well as like connect us with, the, the world around us, connect us with people and just be able to um, just move freely amongst this earth. Yeah. And I also, I mean, it's interesting as I've been learning about ableism and healthism and things like that, I think it's also expanded my definition of what movement means. Like movement can be emptying the dishwasher. It can be folding laundry. It can be like, like it doesn't have to be oh, if I don't like go outside and walk for an hour, then whatever else I do doesn't count. You know, like it, there can be expanded definitions of what is movement. And I think like I find great comfort in that, you know, like I have found for me and my body right now, 30 minutes of kind of circuit type body weight type movement works really well. It might not uh, next month. I don't know. But this month, like 30 minutes is like a good amount for me. I can, it doesn't make me too sore the next day, but it challenges me and I'm sweating. And like, so I think, I think there's something so important when it comes to movement is that that permission for people to attune to what feels right for them. And, you know, just trust that there's something about tr trusting our bodies, which, <laughs> you know, we are actively told not to trust. Yes, we're told not to trust anything about ourselves. And th that's diet culture, y'all. Like, diet, I'm going to tell y'all a secret. <laughs> diet culture wants you to think that you don't know the best about your body, even though you've lived in it your whole life. They think they know better and know better for you, even though they don't know you. And they do this so they can sell you products. That's it. That's it. And that's why my listeners are Fat Joy Rebels. <laughs> that might be the name of my podcast listeners. <laughs> or Love Muffins. We haven't decided. <laughs> love Muffins. <laughs> um, Martinez, let's talk about joy a little bit. I mean, I feel like so much of this conversation has been about doing things that connect you to joy, bring you back to joy. Um what else brings you joy? How do you turn towards joy? 
Oh, well, uh, one thing that has been bringing me joy as of late is um, practicing DJing. So back in undergrad, I put myself through college by DJing parties. And I kind of put it down. You know, years went by. Technology has changed. Um, But I started to pick it back up again. Like, I remember I was just on Guitar Center's website one day and just looking to see, like, I wonder what DJ equipment is out there. And then finding something like a piece of equipment and being like, you know what? I'm going to go buy that. My wife was like, you getting back in DJ? And I was like, you know what? Like, this just might be fun. Like, I need to find hobbies that like, I can just do for fun and like, like not make money from. And it's like, you know, like I, this just might be just be like a, my bedroom DJ phase, but I'm having so much fun with it. Like, um, like we have the little, like the little setters, like literally like next to me is it with their arms reach. And like, um, during sometimes during the day, like I'll be practicing and then like my wife would come in here and like this little green light behind me, like this turns into like a little strobe light. So we'll put the, we'll put the music on, the light change. And it's like, it's like our own little dance party. Here. <laughs> All right. That's pretty sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had underlined the word wife. I wrote down wife underline. Um, I imagine your wife's been on this whole journey with you. She has. She thinks I'm crazy. Ah. But you know. Uh, <laughs> so we good. can't win them all. Um, <laughs> she's a, she's just a great grounding force in my in my life. So like, you know, with this whole thing of like social media and people see you got all these followers and things of that sort, like, oh my god, like he must be amazing or like I love his journey. And my wife is like, I don't care about any of that as long as he take out the trash and rub my feet when I ask them. Like that's what I care about the most. And like take out the dog. So. <laughs> it's good to have those grounding influences yes. for sure. <laughs> I love that. Oh, um, Martinez, it has been so, so wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for sharing all of this with us. I am so excited to kind of follow along and I'm definitely going to check it out. I might join and start maybe running again. Absolutely. Everybody's and, invited to join. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll link to all the information, the first chapter of your book that comes out next week to the Slow AF Run Club website. All that good stuff will be there for people. Um, it's been really amazing. Thank you. I feel really inspired. Thank you for having me and Fat Joy Rebels, aka Love Muffins. The pleasure to be um, for you all to have me here. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is all about. Expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week, you get a new poem. Martinez Evans is all about finding his own path, asking challenging questions, and not just doing something because someone says he should. So the poem I've chosen for this episode is by Ross Barber, and it's called How to Leave the World That Worships Should. Let faxes butter curl on dusty shelves. Let junk mail build its castles in the hush of other people's halls. Let deadlines burst and flash like glorious fireworks somewhere else. As hours go softly by, let others curse the roads where distant drivers queue like sheep. Let emails fly like panicked tiny birds. Let phones unanswered ring themselves to sleep. Above, the sky unrolls its telegram, immense and wordless, simply understood. You've made your mark like bird tracks in the sand. Now make the air in your lungs your livelihood. See how each wave arrives at last to heave itself up on the beach and vanish. Breathe. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life, 
on YouTube at youtube.com slash at FatJoy and on Patreon at patreon.com slash FatJoy. Please do check out the show notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely. I am sending you off with my best wishes for an abundantly FatJoy day. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye.